Claire, have you ever considered adopting a deaf dog? I can't say that I have, Jim. I'm not necessarily opposed to it. It just seems like owning a deaf dog would require a specialised set of skills. Well, that's what you might think, and certainly that is what a lot of people think. However, it turns out that training a deaf dog is really not all that different from training a hearing-enabled dog. Today on the show, we are talking to some of the most prominent voices in the deaf dog community about deaf dog training techniques, deaf dog misconceptions, and most importantly, why deaf dogs rock. Hello, I'm James Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. And I'm Claire Mansell in London, England. Welcome to Dog Edition. Where voices from around the world consider all things dog. Today's episode is all about deaf dogs. How you train them, what they are especially suited to, and how to test to see if your dog is going deaf in old age. So if you love dogs as much as we do, pause what you're doing, leash up your pup, And let's go for a walk, because we've got a lot to talk about on today's episode of Dog Edition. Hey, Pepper, want to go for a walk? So, Jim, I have to say that deaf dogs are not exactly on my radar. As someone who has adopted a handful of dogs in my life, no one has ever said to me, I've got a deaf dog for you and I think you'll love them. Well, I hadn't actually been thinking much about them until we put this episode together. According to Terry Hayward, who is one of the most renowned experts on training dogs and training deaf dogs, that is not very surprising that we haven't thought about it before. If we have a pool of of dogs that are looking for homes, yes, that's true that frequently deaf dogs would be overlooked because people mistakenly might think that it's going to be more challenging or more difficult. And there are a lot of inappropriate and false myths out there about deaf dogs. Yeah. So earlier when I said that owning a deaf dog seems like it might require special skills, I think what I was really trying to say is that owning a deaf dog seems like it could be harder than owning a hearing dog, especially if you can't give them commands like sit or stay in the normal way. So that much is obviously definitely true. They, you can't communicate with them verbally. However, what is not true are some of the personality traits that people tend to associate with deaf dogs. There are myths that separation anxiety is higher. I also specialize in working with dogs who suffer from separation anxiety, and there's no data to support that assertion. There are myths that deaf dogs might be more aggressive. That myth about deaf dogs being more aggressive, it was debunked over 20 years ago in a study that was done by the University of Louisiana. Deaf dogs are 20% less likely to be aggressive than a hearing dog. That's Christina Lee. In 2011, she founded Deaf Dogs Rock, a nonprofit agency that promotes the care and well being of deaf dogs. She herself had adopted a deaf dog named Nitro, and then she realized there were no resources on the internet to help her out. Yeah, like I said, there's got to be some special deaf dog skills, I'm guessing. Well, Kind of. The only special skills that you need are visual cues, which most dog owners already use in conjunction with verbal cues, plus, of course, the universals of dog training 101. Terry Hayward explains. First step is that we teach an auto check-in, because if the dog is reinforced for automatically orienting back to you, then you have their attention, and then you can give them other cues. Second would be to establish a visual marker. So with positive reinforcement, oftentimes we use a clicker. So with deaf dogs having a visual marker instead of that auditory marker. Okay, so this is the stuff of ordinary dog training, except that in this case, we're just emphasizing the importance of a visual cue. Exactly. The only truly special skill that you need is a little extra patience. I think the best way to think about it is what Terry says about deaf dogs. A deaf dog is just a dog that can't hear. Okay, so this might sound like a silly question, but do deaf dogs get trained? (laughs) Well, you never know. Do deaf dogs get trained in sign language? You know, 
They do, or at least some dogs do, the same way that we use words like sit or stay to train a hearing-enabled dogs. Well, deaf dogs are often trained with those very same words, but of course using sign language. In fact, Terry has quite a moving story about using sign language with her deaf dog, Blanca. One time I went to a, it was like a a dog wellness day, and I had Blanca with me. And there was a family there, and apparently the wife was deaf. And they came over because they saw me ask her to sit, and I used the American Sign Language cue for sit. And they saw that, and then they saw her sit. And so they came over, and the husband translated because I'm not fluent in ASL. ASL, of course, stands for American Sign Language. And he said, oh, we saw you give the cue for sit, and, and your dog sat. Does your dog know sign language? And I said, yeah, she's deaf. And this is her cue. And the wife asked if she could try it, and she did. And Blanca sat, and she started to cry because they had a hearing dog but she just never had been able to establish a relationship or communicate with the dog. They just had never thought about using visual cues with their dog. I love that. That's a fantastic story. I wonder if that encounter inspired her and she went on to teach her dog how to use the sign language commands. I sure hope she did. In fact, on DeafDogRocks.com, that nonprofit that I mentioned, there are a set of resources that teach sign language to your dog in sign language. In other words, the course is designed for deaf people who need to train their deaf dogs or really any dog in sign language. We have such a huge deaf community of humans that adopt deaf dogs that we have Savannah on our website and she does all of her training videos in a American Sign Language. So that that's probably the first trainer that's ever done that for the deaf community because they don't have training resources. It totally makes sense that that exists, and I'm surprised it's taken that long for somebody to put this together. Yeah, those folks are doing some really good work there. We have a link to their website in the show notes for today's show. And of course, it is a 501c3, so if you're thinking of maybe where can I make a tax-deductible contribution to help dogs, that's something worth looking at. So getting back to deaf dog training, aside from the emphasis on visual cues, is there anything else that's drastically different between training deaf and hearing dogs? Well, maybe not so much in the training part, but as for the day-to-day habits of the owner, uh uh-huh, there's a difference. I have to get off my butt all the time. The other thing is I'm very particular about having all my gates shut because of off-leash potential issues. That voice is the voice of Melissa Millett, who is another trainer who specializes in training deaf dogs. I was thinking that there was going to possibly be something about having to be off off your butt a bit more. And the off-leash thing was the thing that immediately came to mind as well. Like when you're walking down a path towards a road and you can't yell at them, you know. So I think it's fair enough to say that laziness is not the best characteristic to have as a deaf dog owner or possibly as any dog owner. That does have me wondering, though, about whether there's anything that you can use as like a vibration collar. And by that, I don't mean a shock collar. I just mean something that's that, you know, sends a message physically to the dog. There is a tool like that that is available to people who are training deaf dogs, but it is not something that trainers like Terry or Christina or Melissa rely on. Vibration collars are more of an advanced tool. And what I mean by that is that at the beginning, like I said, we want to teach a check-in. We want to teach an orient to me cue. A couple of those, really. I use a double tap. I use a double tug. Things that can build confidence and can build the skill repertoire of the dog. I would rather see someone teach a reliable recall, which my dog has without a vibration collar. And then later on, like once all of those things are really solid, then maybe there could be an occasion where it would be a good thing to have a further distance, etc. Yeah, I can see that relying on them would be a bad idea because they're electrical, so they can go wrong. Batteries can run out and that kind of stuff. And also, I guess if you are on the lazier side of dog ownership, then potentially you could overuse it and the dog could become desensitized to it as well. Yeah, those are some great points, Claire. We are going to take a break right here, but when we come back, we're going to learn about some of the amazing things that deaf dogs can be trained to do. And now, a message from your dog. 
Every day with you is like a day at the beach, and I want as many beach days as possible. I want to run and sniff and find a good stick to carry. I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want ever pup. It infuses any food you give me with health and life and vibrancy. I can feel it. It's a strange thing to do, sprinkle this powder on my food, but I wouldn't have it any other way. My time with you is precious and irreplaceable, and I'm thrilled to be with you for as long as possible. Here's to puppy playtime and senior snoozes. <laughs> no matter how old I get, I want my ever pup. It just makes me feel good in this life and the next, and the next, and the next. I am so grateful to be your dog and for the ever pup you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com, where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup every day. Welcome back to Dog Edition. So I've been thinking about what Terry said earlier. That's obvious but important point that deaf dogs are just dogs that can't hear. And so if that's true, I would assume that all of the amazing things that hearing dogs can be trained to do can be done by deaf dogs as well. Things like agility and acting and truffle hunting, to name a few things that we've discussed on Dog Edition. So is that correct? It absolutely is. In fact... In some cases, deaf dogs are even better suited for training in some of those fields because they're not distracted by loud sounds. Take Melissa, whose deaf dogs have appeared in film, TV, and commercials. My red healer was on set, and they did a car hit where one car hit another car. And he was in a safe distance. There was no way he could be hurt. But it was a loud smash that would have startled many dogs. Didn't even phase him whatsoever. And it's not just acting. We've seen some of the sheriff's departments use them as therapy dogs because regular therapy dogs, the noise level is just too much in a facility. Even when they're not on the job, deaf dogs can have some advantages over hearing-enabled dogs. We went through a hurricane in 2017, and our two cats and our other dog, everybody was kind of very nervous about all of the goings-on, and, and Blanca just thought, this is fantastic. We're all in the same room together for like 24 hours and wasn't affected at all. Yeah, I've definitely encountered dogs that are not a fan of fireworks or thunderstorms or whatever the loud noises happen to be, so I can definitely see that that would be an advantage. The increased ability to focus is really a superpower that deaf dogs have. Now, Melissa's deaf dogs are not only amazing actors, but two of her dogs, a dog named Lollipop and another one named Jelly Bean, you're getting the theme of her dogs, <laughs> I love it. are also Guinness Book of World Record holders. I didn't even know that dogs could be Guinness World Record holders. That's brilliant. What records did they break? You're going to love this. For Lollipop, it was the fastest four meters on a scooter with a dog and a cat, which was incredible because it was the unimaginable, the unthinkable. Deaf dog being trained, cat being trained, cat and dog performing together. It's my favorite trick ever. Um, for Jelly Bean, it is the fastest five meter pushing of a ball under his paws. So he stands on it and pushes with his paws. And the most bounce passes in 30 seconds between a dog and human. So I bounce it to him and he bounces it back like he's dribbling a basketball. That's amazing. I, I need to see those videos. I'd always say, how does that come about? Do you, do you sit down one evening and go, I know what I'm going to train them for, for the Guinness Book of Records. I'm going to do this. It's pretty neat. <laughs> we will post links to those videos in both today's show notes and, of course, on our website at dogedition.com. Melissa has trained her dog so that the props that she uses are actually the cues for the dog to do 
the trick. So whenever those dogs see a ball or a scooter, for example, they know what they need to do. They need to get to work. I sit here and they'll ride their skateboards and scooters around without me saying anything. And that's something that they both do that I hadn't seen in other dogs. Like just really like you're working on the computer, you look up, there's a dog going by balancing on a ball or pushing a scooter up to you. It's incredible. <laughs> Oh, I think you have to be careful about what props you choose because you could, you know, find your dog doing some dangerous things if it's unsupervised. I feel really inferior now. Maple never goes past doing anything remotely interesting. And in. no, you know, because I love Maltese and I guess maybe multi poos, I, I've decided that the best trick is be cute, be cute, and. Um, <laughs> They do it all the time and no props needed. It's not riding a scooter though, Jim. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, that's true. I want to see a multi-poo on a scooter. <laughs> you know, Claire, something I think worth mentioning is how the guests that we've been speaking to acquired their deaf dogs. They all share a common story, which is that they did not deliberately search out a deaf dog, or at least not the first time. Here is Melissa's story. We were in Toronto doing a really exciting live show. And by we, uh, she's talking about her and her dogs. They were involved in a competition. On the way home, we were struck by a dangerous driver, unfortunately. <laughs> the driver was going 140 kilometers per hour and the dogs were released from their crates. And one of our dogs ran scared and she was hit by a car hit by a car and killed. That dog was a Boston Terrier. And when Melissa let people in her community know about the incident, a rescue had a Boston Terrier and said, hey, are you interested in this dog? And of course that dog was in fact deaf. It was my first deaf dog. And I didn't know that I wanted another dog, but the moment I laid eyes on her, I knew that she had to be mine. Oh, that sometimes happens with dogs, doesn't it? It's like there's a connection. The rest is history, I guess. Yeah. First time deaf dog owners are not usually seeking a deaf dog. But if you ask Christina Lee, given how many deaf dogs there are in shelters that need loving homes, maybe we all should consider seeking out dogs who can't hear. These dogs are amazing. If given the right environment and the right training, and people put work in, you're going to have an amazing dog. Many of them are white, and oftentimes they have a really beautiful coat, and frequently people are like, wow, I haven't seen an all-white dog before, but that's just aesthetics. So, Jim, are all white dogs usually deaf? Because you have a white dog who isn't I've deaf. I've had a lot of white dogs. No, they're, they're not usually deaf. However, this is something that's pretty interesting. We discovered in putting this episode together, there is something called the piebald gene, P-I-E-B-A-L-D, and we'll have information on it in the show notes, it typically contributes to congenital deafness in dogs and a lack of pigment. And that gene, it can result in not only white hair and blue eyes, but sometimes congenital deafness. So now that we know a little bit about how deaf dog training works and how amazing deaf dogs can be and the sort of environments that they can excel in. I want to know more about the condition of deafness. I feel like there's a bit more to unpack here. For starters, what other than white coats and blue eyes and the piebald gene are the causes of it? Here's Terry to explain. I had a dog who had acquired deafness. We had two deaf dogs, one who was congenitally deaf. She was born deaf. And the other who had acquired deafness because he was like 15 years old. So acquired deafness usually comes later in life. But there are other ways. Autotoxicity via certain medications is a possibility. Or sometimes if there were dogs that maybe were in an unfortunate situation and had gotten ear infections that just were never appropriately cared for. Yeah, that does make sense. Um, not to mention accidents as well, I guess, like if a dog gets attacked by something or comes into contact with a heavy object on its ear or something. But in the case of acquired deafness due to age, this can't happen overnight. I imagine there is a sort of spectrum of deafness. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you a brief story. My husband's family had a dog who wasn't allowed on the sofa. And he would go on the sofa when they were out of the house and would always leap off the sofa because he would hear them coming up the garden path. And they would tell he had been on the sofa because the sofa was warm, you know, there was a warm patch on it. But 
as he got older and more death, he would, he would, you know, the door would be opening and he was still on the sofa. So, yeah, he's, <laughs> he was caught. So, yeah, exactly. So bearing all of that in mind, you know, how far off the sofa do you have to be? You know, what, what when are you classified as, as death? Is it like 100% for a dog or 85%? That is a great question. And we took that to Terry for an answer. The only definitive way to determine if a dog is considered deaf is by getting a BEAR test. It's B-A-E-R. It stands for Brainstem Evoked Auditory Response. And the way that they do that is they have some electrodes and they put them sort of on the dog's head and then they hang down some wires. It's theoretically not aversive, could be scary. Yeah, I don't think dogs really want lots of wires on their head and, you know, it's probably not all that comfortable. And those BEAR tests are used also in people where they're a lot more useful because you can ask a person a question and get an answer and like know how much you can hear when the volume goes up and down. Not so likely with dogs. And so therefore, Terry says, you can get those tests, but they're really not all that useful. However, there are some things that you can do at home. There are lots of DIY things that you can do. Like if your dog was lying down someplace, Keeping in mind that if your floor is like wooden and has vibration, that the dog might sense that. So you'd want to make sure that you're not giving yourself away. But if you were to say snap and the dog didn't respond and then you might, you know, take it up to a clap. Sometimes some dogs might ha respond to maybe a high pitch or something. You know, I, I tested a couple of whistles. Blocka did not respond to them. So our producer, Ray, who, who put this episode together, was suspecting that his senior pug, a, a dog named Miko, might be going deaf. And Ray tried the test that Terry talks about with Miko. And Miko did not respond to the finger snaps or did not respond to the medium level clapping. But by the end of the test, Miko did respond to the loud clapping. So Miko probably doesn't have the best hearing, but Miko can get some information. Well, it's a good thing that Ray put this episode together, isn't it? Because he's getting to know his dog better and all of us are learning on this journey with Dog Edition as well. And if indeed, of course, Miko does transition into full deafness, then Ray has all the information here and he knows where to go to learn the sign language as well. Absolutely. Well, that is pretty much all the time we have for today's episode. If you have a dog that is deaf or is experiencing some hearing loss, you can find some helpful links in today's show notes. And we'd love to hear about your dog. Let us know by getting in touch with us at dogedition.com. We have a new Dog Edition adjacent show, which is dropping every other week, and it is called Hound Headlines. It'll be dropping in the same feed as Dog Edition. And if you want to make sure you get that when it drops next week, follow along in your favourite podcast app and you will get it on the day when it is launched. And also, I say this every week, but it's so important. If you want to help this show grow, then please tell a fellow dog lover about it and visit dogpodcastnetwork.com for our other shows as well. I'm Claire Mansell in London, England. And I'm James Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. From all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. 